everybody and welcome back for the fourth no fifth session of the day of the day uh we have uh joining us now uh, dr daniel uh, jacquet he's going to be am i pronouncing your name correctly i'm sorry if i'm not yep perfect all right uh he's going to be giving a talk on some of the work he's been doing for an upcoming exhibit uh thank you so much for joining us uh today dr jacquet Thank you very much for having me and uh, for the opportunity. I'll try to share the screen. Should work. Yeah. Um, so you heard about this exhibition already by uh, when Jessica was talking about this. Um, I'll be using this to um, as a well as a line to talk a little bit about my work. You may know uh, me through my videos, but I would like to just bring you a little bit back behind the scenes. Sorry for those who already heard part of this talk, but I'm gonna speak again about these studies on biomechanics and about moving in armor and how I have shared this, um, uh, these studies, this research on using the, the exhibitions as media. So let's go, if that works. Why? <laughs> Why am I doing this? Um, well, a lot of people hearing here uh, already know this story and everybody has um, a way in. Uh, my way in was uh, medieval studies. So I was studying manuscripts and these so-called fight books. And uh, at some point of my study, um, I undertook this PhD and uh, my supervisor said to me, well, you cannot do all of them. Uh, find find one way or one perspective to work with this. So I chose armor. Um, <clears throat> and then I had this issue that, well, these objects, they are abstract to us. They are cryptic. Um, not for the professional museum curator, not for um, the reenactor, or not for people who are actually working with these objects or these replicas of objects, but for most of the people, as you know, this is really weird. Um, my way in was why this text, this martial knowledge encrypted in manuscript uh, was differently described when uh, fighting in armor and when not in armor. It's obvious, of course, you don't do the same arm bar or arm lock with armor and without armor, but how can actually, can you feel this? Uh, my way in was to say, okay, I have of course, to test. I'm a martial art practitioner as myself, and I always uh, dream to have an armor. And uh, all of my friends were uh, smiling at me when I said, well, this, if we, this will be my PhD project. I would need an armor to test this. Um, they hated me because I managed to get funding to uh, get this. And the idea was not to buy a replica, but to buy well, the perfect solution would have been to live in the late 19th century and just to knock on the door of a um, collector and say, can I borrow your 15th century suit of armor, sir? Um, today we cannot do this. So my goal was to have a replica that not um, replicate the visual aspect. It should not look like, it should work like or work has. Um, as you know, this is pretty difficult to, uh, to do. And uh, I, was, I was happy enough to be able to study this armor that you have on the screen on the left. It's, uh, it's kept at the Kunsthistorisches Museum at the Hofjad de Mooskammer. And it's one of the few uh, 15th century remain, remaining uh, kit. And um, my specialist would know it's not, uh, the, this kit was not worn like this in the Middle Ages, but these are details. So my goal was to, uh, understand this object by wearing a replica to better understand this object. I know the cat is coming. Perfect. Experiencing uh, is not experimenting. There is a difference. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. It's a little bit of an academic jargon here, but uh, experiencing is trying out and experimenting is trying out in controlled environments. It's not to say that one is better than the other, and actually these are two sides of the same coin. You have to try out before your experiments. I've tried to show this in publication, and uh, 
let me talk about the actual research that we did. So as part of the PhD project, um, I work this gear and I work with biomechanics specialists, sports scientists, and I try to make, to measure actually um, the movements, what we call natural movements. So walking, uh, sitting, lying down, laying up, and uh, what they call anatomical movements. So that's all the joints of the body in the three directions. So that's uh, uh, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, uh, internal rotation, external rotation. Um, pretty straightforward, actually. We did this in 2010, 11, and we were quite pissed when this uh, study came out. It leads, so um, some of the scholars over there, uh, uh, Dr. Nicola Pomenti, uh, who is the lead experimenters, did some of the studies we were already doing without, we didn't know about this. But hopefully uh, the results were a little bit different, uh, I'll go down. So I'm not gonna talk this into details now, just show a few of the things we did. So we looked at the range of motion at what a, a standard protocol of the gate analyzes. So this with armor, and of course without armor, so you were filmed with all of these cameras, you see the little markers, so it captures the whole body and all of the fine uh, movements. Out of this came, um, so when you compare this set with uh, the same without armor, then something weird happened. I remember I was sitting uh, on the computer looking at the data and I said, well, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouth, but uh, the light blue is uh, with armor and the dark blue is without armor. I said, how come do I have more range of motion with armor than without? It's not possible, it doesn't work. The, the machine is wrong. And she was quite annoyed by this. No, this is science, this is pretty. So you, you actually have more, more a range of motion. This particular movement is uh, the ankle dorsi plantar flexion. So that's this movement of the feet. And of course, you have more range of movement because of the added weight. So that means, uh, well, that's uh, wearing this on your body, for some of the movements get a greater range of motion and some of others are less uh, wide. Um, the average difference is 2.48 degrees. So that's nothing. Basically for standard motion, wearing an armor doesn't impact your body, not for walking. Uh, it's another story when you try out the maximal range of motion of what they call the anatomical movements. Some of them are quite restricted, some of them are not. Uh, two examples here. So that's the abduction of the shoulder. Same. And this movement has a small restriction. Now, if we look into details, you can see the differences. Some of these are great. This is the greatest uh, difference measured. So that basically, that's this movement. And this movement is restricted. This one is not. And guess what? Uh, martial practitioners would know this, but this movement you need to drive your point into your opponent. This movement you don't need. It exposes a weakness. So these uh, type of armor, uh, let's say from the second half of the 15th century, uh, they were high technical exoskeleton, as you know. And uh, we're working on the hypothesis that it was designed so. So some of the movements are restricted on purpose, some of the others are not. Great, uh, great discoveries. We had fun, um, everything. This was less funny. This was the energy expenditure, the same protocol as the lead study. Um, you have to imagine on this one that you have to run uh, for one minute, one minute uh, and 30 seconds until what they call voluntary exhaustion at each uh, path tempo. And you start one kilometer per hour walking, well, walking like uh, a granny, and then you go up as you can. What we found out is, of course, it, this is exhausting, uh, much more than without armor. We found 66% average increase when the other study found another number, actually twice. And uh, this was, a, well, when I, I am not a sports scientist or a energy expenditure specialist, 
Uh, however, um, uh, it was quite obvious why my results were different than the others, but we maybe can discuss this into the, uh, the question and answer uh, session. Now let's move to um, the question of this video. Why did I do video? Uh, was there anything behind this? You can see the ivory tower, the academic ivory tower data are mine. Well, no, <laughs> they're not mine. Uh, I'm one of the preacher of please share your research um, with kids, with specialists, with uh, the open public. And of course, nobody actually reads these uh, studies that scholars publish. Um, it's weird, you have to log in, you have to pay a lot to get access to this. So a museum exhibition was kind of a good idea to, uh, to actually, well, uh, share this research, try actually. But it's not my work actually, I'm not, um, I don't do communication, I don't do video shooting. And uh, the video that, uh, well, had a success story 2011, has now 4 million views. This was actually made really from scratch. So I was, um, I started the PhD in 2007, 2012, I was ready to, to give that back. Um, 2011 was this exhibition in Paris at the Nas Musée National du Moyen Âge. And um, I met the curator and uh, I discussed, oh, what, what you do is great. Can you just do something? He said, yeah, do you have money? <laughs> and he said, no. So this is a bit of story of the scholars, not, not professional, willing to share. And I said, okay, so if the quality doesn't matter, just, uh, I'm gonna do this. And we did this, uh, this video, you probably have seen this. Uh, it went through different channels. And the idea behind this video was to actually to explain the public obvious uh, misconceptions like, yes, uh, what is an armor for? Does it sustain blows? Uh, is it heavy? Can you move? Blah, 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 this, you know, well, this part, you know. Um, this is not really interesting. Actually, the goal behind this video was to share uh, what I have found in studying these fight books, that there are different steps, logical steps into a fighting techniques. There are sections into this. And this video actually, after this part where you show uh, what an armor is, that you can, uh, I don't know, climb a ladder, uh, do stuff with it, sustain blows, you don't feel anything, blah, blah, blah. Um, this was, if we go this part, well, not the rolling. Yeah, that was that part. So these are the different steps you need into um, a fight when you're fighting on foot, if you read the fight books. The first one is find this weakness and put your pointing. Of course, quite difficult in the visor state of the but uh, and if you miss, then you have to execute a technique to actually gain advantage of the position you're in to actually master it. And this, if you can see, it drives into the lungs through a weakness to armor. First intent was to actually hit this weakness, then you manage this. If uh, someone does this to you, then you have to use, if you can, uh, the, this body motion, the, the, how do you say this? Um, you actually deflect the blow by turning this and use your body, your power, and your added weight to, to put your enemy into a bad posture. If he resists, then you're so close that there is almost no need anymore to use a weapon. Here, you cannot do anything except wrestling, which is a lot in the public sections and uh, when he's down, you need to submit him or you can finish him, basically. So these are the five steps. And uh, this video somehow uh, went viral and was reused in so many um, uh, media and outlet and blah, 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 I lost track of it. I tried to keep track of it, lost it. Um, secret or the behind the scenes here for the, the you listening to me, this video uh, costed 500 bucks to do. Um, and a lot of my friends said, well, how come you should be professional into this? You just, I said, no, no, I'm a scholar. I'm just sharing my research openly with video, even if I don't know how to make them. After this experience, 
I said, okay, so maybe we should go forward and make another one. We actually made two for this small exhibition here in uh, Switzerland. I work for this museum uh, along the line after the PhD. And uh, we made one uh, visualization of a very famous text, um, French one in the beginning of the 15th century. Um, may I turn the volume down? Uh, this one is quite famous for uh, armor aficionados. So that's uh, the knight, the famous knight, uh, Busico, who actually is a biographer, uh, wrote this section and explained how he trained to go uh, for tournament. So there is a series of exercises, uh, and we try to, to put some of them in image. So they just go to the part that are interested. So you can jump on the horse. Uh, without the use of the stirrups. <coughs> or uh, you have to actually have a good lungs and good endurance, so you have to run or, or walk for a long time. Um, again, we didn't have much money to do this one, so I was willing to have one video that was modern, one um, exercise that was modern in a modern context, about the, uh, the actual physical deed. And the other one, which was more in a decorum, uh, didn't got any money to do this. So we just put what we had. Actually, this one is, uh, uh, it's not slashing wood, it's hitting a wooden target. This one was terrible. Uh, climbing the underside of a ladder, you tried this in armor, try it. So here it says, if two walls are uh, about one head of a distance, you can climb up and down without falling. Uh, we use this climbing uh, wall to do to do this. And yes, I wore uh, climbing shoes, not the sort of that that pretty work, works. At the top. I was really afraid because the, the one that was um, Having the rope on the other was a woman that was, I don't know, maybe uh, two thirds of my weight. But I said, not, I should not go doing this. And this is the fun part. If you haven't seen this video, this one is nice. So that's uh, an addition to the manuscript. It's on the side. And he said, Fusico, he was so well known that because he could do the soubresaut without the, without the helmet, soubresaut could do this. Soubresaut could be this, but the actual uh, translator of the text says this is this move. I was quite pissed because I managed to land on the feet once. Um, the next one was this obstacle running armor. We're just gonna go through it a little bit because it's a seven minute video, so we're not gonna watch this. If you haven't uh, watched it already, that's... Um, Comparison between an obstacle run, a military run be, between a soldier, modern modern uh, soldier, a firefighter, and a knight. And uh, we are in Switzerland, so uh, it's perfect. These are not professional soldiers; they are militiamen, and so is the firefighter. So no, I'm not a professional knight, so it was perfect comparison. Except that they were uh, two of them; they were ten years younger than me. Uh, it was a terrible summer day. Uh, and it was important to me to show that um, uh, what you wear underneath is very uh, important. A lot of visitors in the museum, they um, when they see or when they read about the weight of what you eat, yeah, but uh, you don't have to the weight of what you wear underneath. And what you wear underneath actually also limits your movement quite. Um, so we did this uh, first run with what you wear underneath. Just experimenting. Well, experiencing is not, it's not controlled. Also, we did not do the obstacle run as we should. I said, I don't want to have any injuries. I cannot pay for injuries. Um, so we were slow. And uh, when we put on the, the different stuff, we had a discussion about. Uh, should we wear um, uh, a helmet with a fast uh, face? But 
mechanic would be kidding because the firefighter would have oxygen into his nose. So it's like all uh, always put in place. And uh, this comparison was already done almost 100 years ago. Uh, I don't know if you've watched this, but um, um, Metropolitan, Museum, Metropolitan Museum explored uh, video shooting short movies as educational uh, media with this film that is called A Visit to the Night's Gallery. It's uh, online on the, on the website of the Metropolitan Museum and there, you don't have the firefighter, but you have the soldier facing the armored um, uh, fighter to just to compare. It's the same weight, basically. So nothing new here and uh, the firefighter one, which is good. Uh, and for many years, uh, I said, okay, I should do another video. I should do another video. I should do another video. And I had to wait a long time to uh, do another one, to find the time and the energy to do this, because it's not my job, actually. I just do this on the side, basically. And I always wanted to, to find something new. And uh, actually, this one, I have lots of projects in the drawers. I didn't manage to get them. They will come at some point. But the next one is not really uh, something completely new, but at least it's fun. Uh, Something went wrong, so I'm going to start again somehow. Sorry about this. Too much video on this Fredzi. Yes. And we go again. Here. Sorry about this. Here we go again. So we can jump until this, this, this. I'm not gonna go too quick on him, otherwise he might shut down again. We were there. So this exhibition, forthcoming exhibition by uh, created by Stefan Krause. Um, it will open in Vienna at the end of March, uh, March 29. And I uh, hopefully encourage all of you to, if you can, uh, make the trip to come to see this. It's going to be a great show. Uh, what's in there? So the idea is about uh, the armor as objects at the intersection between textile, fashion, and actually what the object in its meaning between the late Middle Ages and the 17th century. You will have there 170 objects on display. Uh, these are the press photo. Thank you for the museum to uh, let me share this with you. And a connoisseur will know which is which. So which come from the Met, which come from the Wallace collection and so on. So uh, this is gonna a lot of great objects put together also in different Ways. So not only armor, but also uh, paintings and uh, documents. So it's going to be really a great exhibition. Um, what I did there, uh, I was asked by, uh, by Stefan, um, well, since you own one of our uh, armor replica, can you do some special videos uh, for um, public engagement about moving? And I said, yeah, I made uh, some, but let's make new ones. Um, this video I was not allowed to share. I, I said, okay, so uh, we should wait until the end of the exhibition so that it can be publicly shared, which is always my, uh, my goal. So you are, um, well, uh, the privileged, privileged ones, a uh, few snaps, few uh, shots. So this is fine motion. So of course the question of the hands and a lot more, uh, I have, I don't know, we have uh, 17 footage. I don't know if they're all gonna be used in the exhibition, but that's gonna be fun. This, you know, uh, this one was a little bit more difficult to do. And I was always afraid uh, of the sound. Yeah. 
I was always afraid because of the ground. I didn't want to destroy the ground. All of these deeds, you know, it's not really special to know, but for the usual or the average visitor, this is great to show that you can actually move. Of course, but this is all you know. But the more uh, funny part was the social media part. I said, okay, let's do some video where we can have a little bit of fun and use this as a promotional material for your exhibition. So this is not actually to share research, just about bringing awareness to the people of uh, the exhibition, but it was really fun. I chose, we, we shot a lot. I didn't want to show everything, but uh, here are a few. Um, I played the armor uh, going to work. So that's the start of the day of an armor. This is uncut uh, raw material. Uh, so uh, this is gonna be, I don't know, uh, fine tuned with everything. Yeah. This was really a grand experience to do this in the actual setting where the objects are. Um, that was perfect. So that's the start of the day of an armor. Uh, an armor needs break, so we went to the coffee. Uh, this was to show the small movement like with the foam. I did include the video with the foam so to show that you can drink a proper espresso with your And uh, since we had the start of the day of the armor, uh, let's have the end of the day. This is my favorite one. Looking forward to see this on uh, social media. Uh, this we done, this we done, this we done. Perfect. And uh, as Chasika mentioned, oh, again, I'm really sorry about this. Um, as Chasika mentioned, I'm going to restart Spreadsy. Uh, as Chasika mentioned, there will be an exhibition uh, catalog with this, and that's quite exciting because there is a good lineup of uh, scholars writing for this uh, exhibition catalog. And uh, I'm just going to want to talk a little bit about my part in this. So I found the Prezi again. I'm going to share the screen that's here and here. This, this. Voilà. So as you can see, a very good lineup of scholars uh writing about different very interesting topics uh i can maybe share mine so um the book is not out it's gonna come uh and um i was asked to write about my experience wearing these stuff and it was a good experience from me to write not as a scholar but as a practitioner and to have a face-to-face -face, uh, essay with uh stefan krause work working with um, medieval and late, late medieval and early modern sources in accordance to my essay. And it was about, uh, it's the five senses uh, in the armor. So can you see, can you hear, can you feel, can you breathe and so on. So this was quite a nice text and uh, I will share this when this will be uh, available, of course. So sorry for the technical glitches that we, uh, we had. And that's the thank you very much for your attention. And uh, this is my current project. Have a look at uh, the blog. We have a quite an active blog. Uh, some of the people in the audience also wrote for this one. So quite good stories. And this exhibition, if you can, just go to Vienna and see this. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much for that fantastic king, uh, I'm sorry, fantastic look into everything you've been doing. Um, 
yeah, that that was really entertaining. Those videos were were great, all of them. Um, fascinating how 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 you came up with that with the idea of them and use them for your research because you know you know a lot of us just do that stuff for fun and we don't um then use it later for research but but you like you said you've made it a way that people actually want to look at it and, and learn more about it and I, I the way to do it does anybody have any questions oh, no. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I haven't got any questions. <laughs> so I have a question on the chat that can go on. Um, I need some feedback on that. Why? Yeah, some echoes over there, yeah. Uh, so why did the energy expenditure differ from uh, the Italians? And uh, some of the results were quite interesting. Um, so there were four subjects uh, in the test and I was one. So of course this is the first difference and the other difference is that these uh, are the uh, so-called interpreters working for leads. So they interact with the public with the armor. They are also national practitioners and they wear the armor regularly. The main difference is that their kit of course was made uh, as for the medi late medieval soldiers, you work with what you have. If you have a princely armor, if you have a Ferrari, you don't write, uh, you don't run the same, you don't drive the same way that if you have a second hand car. Uh, not to say that their armor is a second hand car, but um, there is a difference in manufacturing quality that they, what they have in comparison to mine. But I think the main difference is that I wore this suit of armor uh, when I was doing this, prior to the experiments that we did, I wore it for at least three hours, five days on seven. My wife hated me because of course you cannot, I could not put this on myself alone. So uh, I, I went on this quest to say, I need my body to get accustomed to this, to develop or to build specific muscles all of us who have worn armor knows that it actually affects your body. In the beginning, it hurts. And then if you wear it regularly, then your body finds ways not to hurt. So I was really trained, uh, like wearing it regularly, which, is, which was not the case uh, to the experimenters of Leeds. So this combination of these two factors, my body really accustomed and a perfect fit, well-made armor made a huge difference in the tests huge difference and actually uh, the, the the tricky part is that i believe uh, at that time i was on my third version of the undergarment this is what we have the less uh, sources and objects remaining objects and this is one of the most important part if you want your armor to function a you have to have a good uh, smith that is allowed to understand the shapes uh, the materiality and all the complex system but you really have to have good um, people helping you in tailoring this uh, undergarment. So I don't know if that is a way to answer the question, but I think it's the best I can do. And who who made your the um, arming gear that you that you wear? Well, in the beginning, uh, I bought one off the shelf by an Hungarian um, tailor, and uh, of course, it wasn't a good fit. So I went to different people, uh, I discussed with reenactors and I ended up doing this myself. Oh, really? I didn't have the money. Uh, it was not part of the grants, run out of the money. Uh, so the third version I did myself on uh, advice by reenactors and professional tailors. Mm -hmm. And now it's the seventh version. So it's still a work in process, never finished. Oh, yeah, they, they never last. <laughs> I also, had a also. I, I bought an off the rack arming jacket um, once and I used it for a day and it literally like it, it ripped from here to there. And I'm like, well, that, that there goes that. <laughs> um, it, you're right. My, what you said about your, your wife hated you for, it. I think my wife would probably uh, find something in common with your wife then because it, <laughs> she's constantly helping me gear up and do things around here. And, and you're right. Um, I've noticed myself, and I don't 
wear armor nearly as, as often as you did, but even the, the little that I do wear, it, it, it does change things. It changes how, you know, your, your joints handle things and, and, and movement. So uh, it's amazing to, to see, to, to have other people, you know, um, acknowledge that and, and put that. So let's see here, if you have the 16th century suits that have articulated joints made of segmented plates, does that style of armoring produce a noticeable difference in mobility compared to plate with mail at the joints and, and or just padding? And some some uh, some people already answered or give their opinion to this uh, question. Yeah, of course, every armor would be different. Fine tuning. If we had to do when I went, when I did that study, they said it's perfect. It's a proof of concept. Let's do proper science now and get seventeen different types of armor and compare compare them. I said ah. Yes, if we have money, yeah, great, but uh, not there yet. But uh, yes, there are fine, uh, fine differences. Also, different armor or different systems are made to um, um, allow different type of movements. These, mm -hmm. Some of these gear are made specifically to allow very small movement on the horseback. Some of them allow for larger movement in what we could say, <sighs> It's really difficult. Uh, scholars have been fighting or debating against what is this a field armor? What is a field armor? What is the adjusting armor? They, they were intangible, interchangeable uh, gear. So basically, at the ends of uh, the Middle Ages, you didn't buy an armor, you, you buy a kit of interchanging piece. If you want to fight on foot, you will choose that gauntlet. If you want to fight uh, with the axe, you will find another gauntlet. You will change your helmet. You will change different parts. You will adjust uh, things. Now the question was about the joints. And yes, this articulated plate uh, would offer less movement on the side, but more movements in this uh, suggestion. However, um, they also managed to have really incredible um, systems to allow different rotation type as well with uh, riveting this is this is art <laughs> this is art it is <laughs> it is hard it there must have been an amazing understanding of human mechanics uh by armors and able to build these things that that allowed a certain range of motion is there anything in doing this study and and basically living in your gear for so for for this amount of time is there anything that surprised you in doing this uh, something that you're like wow i never thought that was going to happen in, in any of this or <laughs> yeah a lot a lot of them i remember having a small notebook uh, writing this down it's somewhere but it was 10 years ago i don't wear this now it's it's there yeah <laughs> it's there <laughs> but um yeah uh if i have to bring one of two striking memories about what I encountered. Um, I remember being mad um, of having the kit and having it to change, like uh, mistakes that we did in the beginning in the designs or choices that we made when it was uh, made. Um, so, well, this would function better if this plate would be slightly more this, so you have basically you have to adjust your kit all the time, and sometimes you need the smith. And my smith was uh, seven hours drive away. So <laughs> this is this this was my most painful memory. Saying, "Well, uh, I have to go back. We have to change this, or we have to adjust this." And uh, I'm now a master at riveting. I don't oh. know how much time I have uh, took out the leather, re-riveting and everything. So yeah, fine tuning That's you. That is something that a lot of people don't understand with armor. They, they think that it's just something you have and it, 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 it lasts. But no, you're right. You constantly have to, to tinker and, and swap out old straps or new arming points or something. There's always something that has to be fixed somewhere. <laughs> yes. And it's terrible because uh, it's like having children and having your family saying, well, you should do like this, or you should do like this, or you should do like this. Everybody has another mind, uh, opinion, and everybody can prove this. Like, don't put w, WD-40 on your armor. Don't put this, or don't put this, or don't do this with your leather. No, no, no. <laughs> so you have to find your own way, but you have to listen to professionals. Mm. And uh, this is invaluable um, 
I don't know, my, my work led me to meet and work with incredible people, restorers, armor makers, smith creators, scholars, and all of their um, feedback was really important to me, but sometimes it's a little bit difficult just to put all of this information and to find the right way, what you need actually. That's the story of everybody's life. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Chad Becker asked in the chat, in regards to range of motion, did the added weight on your extremities, your arms specifically, result in a greater range of motion during ballistic movements when inertia would play a more significant role? Okay, if I understand correctly the question, if I transfer this to what I explained with the ankle, is that the, the, bo the body weight, added weights to this ankle on the ground will make it greater because of the added weight. And now we're speaking about the arms. Um, what is, what do you, uh, I'm not sure to understand what he calls ballistic movements. Uh, Chad, if you're here, could you uh, enlighten me? I wonder, if, I wonder if it's like that, um... Uh, basically the fighting movements like you know coming in and okay and, yeah. like, right yeah. right yeah if, if it if you're trying to move your arms in a very quick manner is it going to take longer to slow down or is it going to take longer to accelerate yeah we haven't tested that but uh i i remember speaking a lot with hema people and people uh, reading this text and uh, people that don't wear armor have uh experience based on their own body and I said, just wear an armor, it would be different. <laughs> it will really be different. And yes, I guess that it will be longer to start, well, more um, energy to put in and more difficult to stop down. So you have, but that's very small. Uh, these, the arms are not that heavy. Uh, it's the whole uh, forward motion. So it's not only your arm that works forward, it's the, the whole body. And the whole body uh, with the hips and everything, then, then you have the added weight. I'm not sure I understood, uh, I answered your question, but uh, we would need to test that. There's the next test. There, <laughs> there's the next video. Um, yeah, I've always always because I've owned, I've owned a couple of different suits over the past years, and the my the later latest suit I had was like sort of a, a late 15th century harness, and I even though it had more metal on it, I always found it to feel much lighter than the 14th century gear. Uh, maybe because it was made all to, to fit together better and to be distributed over my body better than, than the, like the male of the 14th century gear and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, and I'm sure I had a point with what I was saying and I've completely <laughs> forgotten it. All right. One of the great uh, life-changing uh, piece of gear I had is when I managed to understand that the doublets need to, needed to be corseted. So when I close this, uh, I lose, I don't know, three, four centimeters of my waistline. And uh, if you have this adjusted to the uh, cuirass sitting on this part, so basically enclosing or encapsulating your uh, waistline between the lower rib and the hip, then you could. If you have this, uh, your life gets so much better, <laughs> really. <laughs> Let's see. Does anybody, anyone else have any questions for uh, Dr. Jacquet? Yeah, actually, I had a question. Um, I had a question. Go so ahead. I noticed on, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I noticed on the video when, uh, Daniel, when you were doing rock climbing. Yep. So uh, I have a lot of experience wearing armor and especially some styles of queases come very, very high up on your hips. And I noticed that they often restrict your movements when you're trying to lift your legs that high. Yep. Uh, but you didn't seem to be having that much trouble. Mm. No, my, my quiz don't reach that high and the, the limbs uh, that you wear underneath, they, they are quite articulated. So I can actually, with my armor, I can do this. Ah. So also uh, some of the armor that are made, you need this if you want to climb on your horseback. 
Um, well, that's true. So if your armor is only made to fight on foot, or for example, the Tonglet armor, they don't have this uh, high uh, range of motion for the mobility, but that again, depends on what your suit is made for. Mm, depends on the style, I see. Anyone else? It's time for coffee then. I guess so. <laughs> well, actually, now it's time for the most important question uh, of, yeah. of, of the day. Dr. Daniel Jacquet, what is your favorite arm? The, the most obvious answer would be this one, but I hate her. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Uh, the, my 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 um, my most vaunted piece. I almost got it because if COVID wasn't there, uh, we would have a project that would probably help me go in there, but it's not there yet. That's the um, suit of the Henry VIII for the field of the close of gold. Oh, the one yeah. in the um, in the chat, someone mentioned about this uh, study with the uh, astronaut in the spacesuit. That's this one. Uh, Captain Leeds, uh, this sometime I would like to have or possess a replica, not the original one. Yeah, <laughs> that is a, a fantastic, um, fantastic suit. But I, I, and you know, I completely understand what you're, you say. Oh, I should say this one, but I hate it. <laughs> there are times I'll be gearing up to go into a school and I'll just look at it and I'm just like, why am I doing this? <laughs> yes, I also do this with the kids. It's 45 minutes, so. Exactly. Yeah. I, it's, it's, or I'll like, I'll, I'll, I'll have it in its travel gear and I'll like, I'll pull the box down and I'll be like, I can't believe I put that on my body. <laughs> no, just... I don't, I don't, I don't do this. I wear it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's probably easier, easier for you to, to get places wearing it than, than for me. Well, Dr. Shakay, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon, evening for you. Uh, it was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed watching everything you've done. I can't wait to see everything that you're going to do in the future. And hopefully um, people can get over to see that, uh, that new exhibit and uh, sing your praises about it. So, and, and thank you for giving us the, the world premiere of those two short videos. That was, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for having me and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. I feel I, I, feel I do. Huh? <laughs>